All right, chapter uh, 42, care of the patient with uh, chronic illness. Um, as a uh, EMS provider, you are going to uh, get many calls uh, in uh, for patients who have a long-term chronic illness, and uh, many of these illnesses, once diagnosed, um, uh, they may take medications to alleviate some of the symptoms, but um, the disease process uh, continues and the disease actually gets worse and can be exacerbated like in the case of somebody with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who gets pneumonia uh, <clears throat> you know so um, it constitutes a, a, a large share of your uh, ambulance call dealing with uh, patients with chronic illness. Uh, we're going to talk first a little bit about home health um, Acute care is short-term medical treatment for injuries or illnesses provided in a hospital. So when we have a patient who uh, needs acute care, they go to a hospital or uh, uh, an acute care clinic. Home care is health services um, that promote, restore, and maintain a level of comfort uh, or functional health or dignified death. So home care is health care services that allow the patient to stay in the home. Uh, and by allowing them to stay in the home, oftentimes it's been shown that uh, even with chronic illness that they uh, may are able to manage their illnesses uh, better uh, when they're in a more comfortable environment that they feel more comfortable in uh, and are looked upon uh, daily or a couple times a day to make sure they take their medications, uh, assist with uh, other things that they might need. Uh, hospice is a specialty branch of uh, chronic illness where um, a uh, hospice organization uh, provides uh, for the special needs of those uh, with terminal illness. Home care providers uh, can be professionals uh, who are uh, full-time. Um, they can uh, be recovering or disabled uh, or <laughs> not them, not the professionals. <laughs> Let me back that up. Uh, <clears throat> home care providers uh, are typically professionals, usually registered nurses, LPNs, uh, um, home care aides, uh, who are full-time, they're compensated, they're paid by an organization. Uh, and they help those um, who are disabled in the home, those with chronic, uh, who are chronically ill, uh, who are terminally ill, who may be recovering from, uh, you know, maybe they were placed in the hospital again with pneumonia uh, and when discharged uh, may need some uh, further care. Uh, home care providers also help uh, those patients who just need a little assistance with uh, daily uh, activities of living. Um, and it can be a very uh, a formal process uh, or it can be uh, uh, quite uh, informal as well. Uh, we see organizations, uh, not necessarily uh, registered nurses and those that provide medical care, but we see organizations going into the homes now that will um, that will help the uh, elder patient or help the patient with a chronic illness uh, do things like their laundry or take them to appointments or um, you know shop and get their groceries for them. Uh, home care providers include home health agencies. Um, now, home health agencies uh, usually answer to a board of health, um, and they may be part of a hospital system, or they may be standalone uh, and supported solely by uh, the county, and again, answer to a, a county board of health. Uh, hospices, again, may be part of the hospital uh, system. Uh, they may be a standalone agency. Um, may be linked with uh, home health agencies within a county. Uh, there are the homemaker home care aides, uh, and there are staffing and private duty agencies uh, that will uh, have people for hire that will come into the home, uh, and some may stay in the home for a 12-hour shift, and then another person comes in for the next 12-hour shift. Um, that happens uh, quite frequently. Uh, and then there are, are, are certainly home care uh, companies that specialize in medical equipment supplies. Um, uh, you know, we have several of those in town that 
uh, provide walkers and wheelchairs and commodes and um, uh, CPAP units and uh, you know just about anything that a person would need as far as specialized medical equipment and the supplies for that medical equipment. Uh, home care recipients, those who receive home care occur, or of course could be those with an acute illness who have recently been discharged and just need some follow-up uh, in their own home. Uh, those with long-term health conditions, uh, those who are permanently disabled, uh, those with terminal illnesses, and again those who require special medical equipment uh, like ventilators and um, uh, dialysis units and uh, those sort of things. <coughs> um, one of the benefits of home care is that it's it's cost effective. Uh, it's um, far less expensive to uh, treat the patient in their own home than it is to keep them in a hospital. Um, another thing about um, uh, a another advantage of uh, home health is it allows the patients to take an active role in in their own care. Uh, it helps supplement the care that, that perhaps the families uh, or friends are able to provide. And it helps that individual maintain uh, dignity and independence. And, you know, believe it or not, um, uh, you know, one of the worst places that you want to be when you're sick is uh, in a hospital. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, m many people who are in the hospital are very sick, uh, may have uh, transmittable diseases as well. Uh, and uh, it, it, it being able to treat the patient in their home uh, actually exposes them to lesser risk of getting a nosocomial infection. A nosocomial infection is a hospital acquired infection. And for a while things like MRSA and some of these other uh, superbugs that you find in hospitals uh, it was believed that was the only place you got those or picked those up were in hospitals. Uh, but now we're, we're seeing those sort of bugs in the community as well. Um, you know, there can be some detrimental aspects of home care too. Uh, most states have legislation that outlines and defines, and as I had mentioned, most home care or home health agencies are governed by a, uh, a board of health. Uh, to make sure that the patients are licensed, or make sure that the uh, providers are licensed uh, and that they're properly trained. Um, otherwise, if you don't have those sort of things in place, you can get unlicensed, improperly trained caregivers that uh, certainly can do a lot of damage for somebody who's chronically ill. Uh, you can get unsafe care, unprofessional care. Um, they may not have the uh, necessary equipment or supplies. Um, and so these can be really detrimental uh, in the home. Um, the typical response uh, for a advanced life support service uh, to a home care patient uh, is usually to transfer them. Uh, the home uh, health um, representative, the registered nurse, uh, that may be caring for the patient in the home, uh, knows the patient's whole history. Um, you know, they may be caring for them uh, for chemotherapy, for pain management, wound care, ostomy care, uh, hospice care, or palliative care. Uh, but you can throw in there too. Uh, I know when, when speaking to uh, our home health uh, registered nurses, you know, what are some of the more common sort of problems that they see? Uh, it includes, again, things like pneumonia, uh, uh, COPD exacerbation. So you can throw those things in there as well. So while caring for the patient, you know, they may be providing wound care in a patient who gets septic. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you may get that 911 call to uh, transfer the patient to the hospital. Um, some problems that require acute intervention, uh, as, as in any patient, if you're called to the scene of a home care patient and now they have a new onset of altered mental status, uh, or they're having trouble breathing, or in respiratory failure, uh, or cardiogenic shock, or septic, uh, you know, those are problems that you're going to have to uh, deal with in a home care patient. It could be equipment malfunction as well. 
and in uh, many situations uh, if the equipment malfunctions we're still able to care for the patient as an example if if there's a leak in the ventilator circuit and they can't get it fixed and um, the patient needs ventilated that's something that we can do uh, without the uh, ventilator until they can get that uh, fixed um, they could have a gastrointestinal or a genitourinary crisis as well and uh, you know we talked about the medical patient with the complaining of abdominal pain uh, how many you know multiple things that could be and um, uh, it, you couple that with the fact if, if we're dealing with elder patients uh, whose um, uh, pain perception is is altered uh, they can have serious uh, ab abdominal catastrophes going on like a infarcted bowel or a, or an infarcted kidney or something like that from low blood supply and um, not even feel any sort of pain. Your uh, uh, assessment and management of a, a home care patient is no different than uh, any other patient that you go to. Um, it begins with scene safety but I think it's important that we look around at the environment to make certain that the environment is safe. Uh, we know that falls is the number one cause of death in the elderly and as a responder in the, in the home of perhaps an, an elder home care patient uh, you have that opportunity to look at that environment and determine whether there's a lot of loose rugs or there, there's an absence of handrails or uh, things like that, uh, adequate lighting you know those sort of things. Um, like all patients once the scene is safe and uh, you've gained access to the uh, uh, patient is this an injury or an illness <coughs> and then you do your initial assessment with your general impression and your ABC's but we also want to uh, try to get a, a good history noting their health problems uh, and what's normal for them uh, if they're on any medical devices, are they, you know, operating properly? Uh, what sort of medications do they take? Um, and you'll want to compare your baseline information to what's given to you uh, by the caregiver. So if you've got a, a home health registered nurse there who's called the ambulance because the patient has an altered mental status, which is new for them, uh, you're going to get that history from the uh, home care registered nurse. Um, but the nurse would have taken vital signs and those sort of things at some point in time in caring for this patient so uh, you can compare what you get with uh, what they've gotten. Now at, at times this this can be a um, a sensitive relationship between the paramedic and the home care registered nurse because the registered nurse has been in contact with the physician, the registered nurse has been in contact with the family, the registered nurse has been doing assessments and knows the patient's history and essentially believes that perhaps the patient just needs a ride to the hospital. And when you come in and you start doing all the things that you're supposed to do, um, you know, there may be a clash in that, uh, that initial uh, response. Uh, and I, I think it's important that we, uh, you know, that we acknowledge um, that, uh, yes, we know that you call this because the patient has this problem, um, but there are things that we need to do uh, to assure the uh, patient is receiving adequate care right now uh, and is safe prior to transport. Your focus history and physical exam would be a, uh, you know, you'll have to decide based on your ABCs. Uh, whether you need to do a rapid assessment or rapid transport or whether you can stay and gather some more information. Um, the uh, home care nurse will have a patient file with patient medical records. Uh, it's not likely they're going to hand those records over to you, um, but uh, get any information that you can. Um, you're going to inspect, palpate, auscultate, do the things that you've been taught to do when you do a physical exam, but look for things like skin breakdown. Uh, decubitus wounds, uh, bruises or injuries consistent with dependent adult abuse, uh, and then uh, you know maybe provide some intervention there on the scene, and then make some decisions on uh, whether you um, uh, transport quickly or not. Uh, your management treatment plan for the home care patient includes uh, ABCs. Uh, many times what we do is supportive because it's not like the patient hasn't been receiving care. 
uh, for their condition. Now, if their condition gets worse, like an exacerbation of their COPD and they can't breathe, well, then obviously we're going to come in and do the things that we do to treat patients with exacerbation of COPD. Um, <clears throat> so supportive. ABCs. Um, understand some of these patients may have Foley's, they may have indwelling catheters, uh, they may be, um, uh, they may have infusion pumps uh, and home ventilators. And uh, those are just additional pieces of equipment uh, that we need to uh, deal with in, in the uh, home care patient with, who's chronically ill. Um, uh, again, uh, here they're referencing the uh, injury control and the prevention in the home care setting or how to prevent injuries from occurring uh, in a, uh, a homebound patient. Um, you know, when we look at the epidemiological triangle, we know that disease is the direct result of an unhealthy reaction among the host, the agent, and the environment. Well, of late, we're, we're looking at trauma as a disease. And injury prevention is the key uh, to, um, to, uh, to treat this disease that we're calling trauma. And you're the eyes and the ears in the prevention measure success. Uh, so, you know, if, a, if you go into a home, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, there are no handrails, and the lighting's poor, and there's a lot of loose rugs, or there's clutter, uh, or there's um, spoiled food, uh, out in the open. Um, you know, those are some things that you need to bring to the attention of the uh, ED staff uh, with the hopes that uh, uh, perhaps they would uh, order some sort of um, um, in-home assessment to see what they could do to uh, make that environment uh, safer for the patient. Um, <coughs> some specific acute home care situations. Uh, many of these patients may be on oxygen therapy uh, found in the home. Uh, they may have uh, both uh, an oxygen generator, which is the machine that will um, concentrate the oxygen that's in the air and uh, usually doesn't um, uh, achieve flow rates greater than about four uh, liters per minute. Um, so you may walk into a, a home of a home care patient. You can hear the machine running um, and understand that it's only given somewhere between 2 and 4 liters per minute of 100% uh, oxygen. Um, and if the patient is uh, working really hard to breathe, then the, um, that 4 liters by nasal cannula is not going to be enough. You also may come across a patient who has oxygen tanks uh, in their home with... Um, you know, feet of uh, oxygen tubing stretched clear throughout the home so that they have access to that um, uh, oxygen. And in most cases, it's still going to be by cannula. Um, here's a, uh, a uh, home ventilator. Uh, that looks more like an oxygen concentrator to me, uh, where uh, it, again, pulls the 21% uh, oxygen out of the room air, concentrates it uh, to 100%, and then puts it out at a, a rate of somewhere around 2 to 4 liters per minute. Um, maybe cylinders, um, maybe the concentrator, and I shouldn't forget uh, the potential for liquid oxygen systems. Uh, now, the, the advantage, certainly, of liquid oxygen systems is a small amount of liquid oxygen um, as the liquid is converted into a gas, as pressure is let off of it, uh, you can store months and months and months of oxygen in a very small liquid oxygen system. Uh, nasal cannula mask, uh, there may be a non rebreather mask, they may have a tracheostomy collar if they have a trach uh, to deliver their oxygen. Um, you're familiar with the tracheostomy, it's a hole in the throat. Um, uh, tracheotomy is the surgery, uh, ostomy is the hole. Uh, so when they talk about a tracheostomy, they're talking about the hole in the trachea uh, that's uh, uh, in the throat. Uh, they're going to have some kind of tracheostomy tube uh, that can become plugged, that can become dislodged. 
Uh, here's an example of all the different types of, of tubes that are out there. Uh, some have uh, trochanters uh, in the center uh, that allow it to be a little stiff. And then when, once you place it in um, the hole, you remove the center trochanter, you inflate the pilot balloon. Um, some have balloons, some don't have balloons. Um, some are held in place by ties. Some are held in place with commercially available devices. Um, but these can become dislodged. These can become plugged. Uh, and you need to know uh, how to deal with those when that does happen. Now, if you're not real familiar with how to replace a tracheostomy tube, uh, oftentimes the home care provider that's been caring for that patient for you know weeks on end may may have to uh, uh, you know flush it a couple times a day, may have to remove it and replace it once every other day or once a week or something like that. Uh, here's just another example of some different sort of uh, tracheostomy tubes uh, that you might see. Uh, home ventilators. Um, it is within your scope, certainly, to transport a patient on a ventilator. And uh, if you don't have the ability to, um, you know, to uh, hook up a transport ventilator, because that may or may not be a piece of equipment you have, your options are limited. You can either bag the patient yourself, um, which really isn't near as effective as putting them on a ventilator, or bring the home ventilator with you as long as it's uh, functioning properly. You may get that patient too where you're called to take them to the hospital for some reason that has nothing to do with their ventilator or their breathing, uh, in which case it would be of, of uh, interest to uh, either match the settings on your transport ventilator with theirs uh, or bring theirs with. And again, here are some different types of uh, home ventilators. Uh, that one on the right is um, that's a, a, a hyperbaric chamber uh, where the body is inside, uh, pressure is increased, uh, it's a 100% oxygen environment, and it drives the oxygen into uh, the tissue. And this is used primarily for wound care and wound healing. Um, CPAP is certainly something that you'll have in the home as well. Uh, there are many patients that suffer from sleep apnea, so they may have a CPAP machine in their home. Um, remember that when using uh, CPAP, uh, which we should be very uh, familiar with, comfortable with, uh, and we should use in most all patients with respiratory distress, um, the patient does have to be awake and able to follow commands. Uh, because CPAP, depending on the pressures that you use, um, you know, may uh, cause gastric distension and may increase their risk of vomiting. So they need to be able to, to manage their airway in those situations. Uh, BiPAP is, is a bi-positive airway pressure. <coughs> CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. You have the same pressure going in as you go have coming out. So I've got a little bit of pressure to help me take that breath, and I have that same amount of pressure that I'm breathing against when I exhale, kind of like sticking your head out the window of the car while it's going down the road. And that helps stent my alveoli open so that I can recruit new lung tissue and get good gas exchange. By level, you have more coming in than you do coming out. And in patients with chronic respiratory failure like COPD that have been working really hard to breathe and have that increased work of breathing, BiPAP may allow them to breathe easier. Uh, remember that CPAP and BiPAP are not ventilators. If the patient needs ventilation, then you have to provide that yourself. Uh, CPAP and BiPAP are oxygenation. They're going to improve your oxygenation, which should decrease work of breathing. Um, you'll begin your uh, assessment for airway and respiratory problems by noting their general impression. And remember, uh, you can see somebody who is uh, working hard to breathe. They may be in the tripod position. Um, you know, they may be um, uh, using their intercostal muscles, nasal flaring. Uh, there may be some grunting, which would be their own way of uh, providing a little bit of uh, uh, PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Um, 
you're going to assess their uh, circulation as well, uh, feeling for pulses, skin color, temperature, moisture. And if the patient is in respiratory distress, uh, getting a history may indicate uh, why they're in respiratory distress. Uh, if the patient was discharged uh, with uh, congestive heart failure, uh, you know, they may have an exacerbation of their CHF and now have acute pulmonary edema, uh, which is the reason for their respiratory distress. If they've got a tracheostomy and are having trouble breathing, it could be a mucus plug. And again, uh, for us to um, uh, for us to to manage that, we'd have to squirt a little saline down the uh, trach tube and bag it a few times to try to break up that mucus, and then put a suction catheter in there to suction that stuff out. Uh, if they are ventilator dependent, uh, see whether or not there have been any recent setting changes. Uh, or whether or not perhaps the uh, ventilator is malfunctioning. Um, <clears throat> As with all patients, when we're doing our assessment for our, our, our airway, we have to make sure that the airway is patent uh, and maintainable. Uh, and if it isn't patent, we have to make it patent. Uh, if it's a trach tube that's plugged, we have to unplug it. Um, you know, if it's an upper airway that's obstructed from swelling or uh, any other uh, particular reason, uh, we have to, um, you know, make every effort to ensure that the airway is patent and that we can get air uh, from outside into the lungs. Um, <clears throat> again, you may have to remove a tracheostomy tube and uh, replace it. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that process, um, you know, hopefully maybe when you're doing some of your in-hospital in clinicals and you're in the ICU, um, you'll, you'll see a patient that has a trach, and uh, if you're with them long enough during a shift, you might help with some uh, uh, trach tube care. Um, but uh, in any event, if it's, a, if it's a trach tube that has a balloon, you'll have to deflate the balloon and then pull it out. Uh, and then uh, insert a new one, uh, reinflate the balloon, that sort of thing. Just remember, though, that while you're doing those airway procedures, uh, the patient may or may not be getting adequate ventilation. Uh, so it's important that uh, we're quick with these procedures uh, so that we don't make the patient hypoxic and hypercarbic. Uh, and here again, they're just showing you some of those have a trochanter that runs down the center that helps make it rigid. Uh, and allows you to um, uh, replace the, uh, the tube. Uh, and then you pull the trochanter out of the center. You, re you inflate the balloon if it has one. Uh, and then you just uh, hook up your bag mask and assist their ventilation that way. Um, it's important that you get the right size tube. And in most home care patients that have trach tubes, they have replacement tubes there. They have a supply of them. Um, because they do become dislodged and they do need changed. Uh, so you would use uh, the proper size, uh, you know, an improperly sized tube, uh, particularly if it's too long, uh, may end up in uh, one stem or the other, either right stem or left, left main stem. Um, Worst case scenario, if you don't have a replacement tube, uh, you can use an endotracheal tube, and you just put it in the stoma. You just put it in the ostomy, uh, the tracheostomy. Uh, you just again have to make sure that uh, you know that's just usually right above the area of the carina, and you don't have to go very far in, uh, and you would assess its patency as you would any endotracheal tube. End tidal CO2 with waveform, uh, listening to lung sounds on both sides uh, to make sure you didn't insert it too far, uh, and then you'd probably have to uh, uh, tie it in place. Now, sometimes because we're if if you use a endotracheal tube uh, in the uh, tracheostomy because that's all you have, uh, you'll have to um, cut that down uh, rather than leave this uh, great big long length of tube sticking out of the throat. Um, in dealing with a patient who uh, has a respiratory compromise and is on a home ventilator, 
um, and they are in now in respiratory distress uh, with an increased work of breathing, uh, you have to, uh, you know, fix that. Uh, that's why you were called. Uh, you have to improve their oxygenation and improve their ventilation. That may require you to remove the patient from the home care device and to use positive pressure ventilation. Uh, it may require you to replace the O2 system, uh, to change the flow rate, uh, to uh, adjust the home ventilator to improve uh, ventilation. And we often use the uh, dope mnemonic to help us troubleshoot uh, equipment in the home. Uh, the D is uh, dislodged. Maybe the tube has become dislodged. Uh, o is obstruction. Maybe the tube is obstructed. Uh, P is a pneumomediastinum or pneumothorax. Uh, and E is equipment failure. Um, <coughs> Dealing with a patient who has a tracheostomy tube, uh, there can be quite a bit of anxiety on the part of the patient, especially when you don't ventilate them at an adequate rate. Um, you know, imagine somebody uh, holding their hand over your nose and mouth and not allowing you to breathe for 30 seconds uh, while they mess around and do stuff. Um, that's going to make you quite anxious. And the uh, patient uh, with the tracheostomy um, they never quite get used to um, having that um, removed or replaced or uh, having saline squirted down there and then assisting the ventilations to break it up and then suction them. Uh, just remember, you don't want to make them uh, hypoxic. Uh, talk to the patient before you do that so that they know what's coming and they can assist you in any way they can, perhaps with a forceful cough. Um, if the patient cannot speak, then use some other alternative form of uh, communication. Circulatory problems could include things like cardiomyopathies, uh, post-MI, uh, congestive failure, uh, post-open heart surgery, post-heart transplant, um, those patients with heart disease or congenital heart disease, uh, those patients with stable and unstable angina haven't quite had the uh, STEMI yet or the end STEMI, uh, and then those with uh, chronic hypertension. Uh, <coughs> they may have... Um, vascular devices uh, that are implanted as an example in the patient who receives dialysis they may have an arteriovenous fistula or an arteriovenous graft and um, uh, they may also have uh, well these are called uh, shunts and they um, they're gonna when they do dialysis they access those shunts now a um, a Atriovin, take that back, arteriovenous fistula, they take an artery and they attach it to a vein. Um, An arteriovenous graft is, um, they will use a section of synthetic uh, vessel uh, to connect an artery to a vein. Um, the benefit of using a artificial section of, uh, ma of uh, material to connect the artery to the vein is that um, uh, there's less risk of aneurysm. Uh, if you've seen anybody on dialysis, you can see their shunt. And um, uh, it, it is, it's quite large and it's very easy to access uh, for dialysis. It's not something we should access for just standard IV fluid. Uh, I would imagine, I guess, in an emergent situation, life or death, and that's the only vessel you have access to, uh, you, you might be able to access it. But as a general rule, we don't touch the uh, dialysis shunt at all. But if you look at them, some of them will have, you know, some of them will become extremely huge and have big nodules on them or aneurysms. Uh, and that's that occurs when they use... Uh, just when they just attach an artery to a vein. But when they put that little synthetic piece, and that's the piece they access, that little synthetic piece, um, that often um, uh, decreases the risk of aneurysm. So there's the graft, and uh, where they take a synthetic piece and attach that artery to a vein. 
Central venous catheters include things like Rochant's. Uh, they're, uh, they're placed in the subclavian uh, and threaded in uh, to the just right uh, into the uh, superior vena cava, just above the right atrium. Uh, and then uh, they have ports outside the body that you can access. Uh, to give your fluids, give your drugs, and they go right into the central circulation. Uh, they may have implantable ports, uh, and again, you'll see those little raised uh, uh, lump. You can feel them, uh, and you have to have a special needle called a Huber needle. A Huber needle. Uh, it's a needle that's bent at a 90 degree angle, and it's kind of like a butterfly with a, a 90 degree bend in the needle. And uh, that's used to pierce the skin uh, and uh, go then into the port uh, where you can uh, draw blood from, you can give fluids and medication. A uh, peripherally inserted central catheter is a pick line, uh, and picks uh, go in the uh, usually the uh, AV. Um, and, um, or excuse me, the AC. And when you um, start that pick in the AC, it's threaded up uh, the arm and uh, migrates its way into the uh, subclavian and then ends up uh, again in that um, uh, inferior vena cava. Or, excuse me, superior vena cava. Um, some potential problems with shunts include um, infection and you would know that uh, you know based on the fact that it's warm and inflamed and red and um, the patient may even be feverish um, if you touch a shunt like a, a shunt used for dialysis um, you can often feel uh, what they call a thrill uh, as the blood pulsates um, from that artery into the vein uh, uh, with every beat of the heart. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting feel. Um, I don't know how to describe it other than uh, when I felt my cousin had a, uh, a NAV fistula for his dialysis and uh, when I touched it, it was almost like electrical. Um, I could just feel the vibration uh, with every uh, beat of his heart. Uh, management for circulatory problems include ABCs, uh, oxygen, uh, central venous catheter emergencies would include uh, dislodgement, uh, hemorrhage, infection, uh, which uh, certainly could lead to uh, blood loss, could lead to an embolus. Uh, which all could lead to hemodynamic compromise. Uh, as far as GI problems in the home care patient, um, they may have a uh, increased uh, peristalsis, uh, which would also be hyperactive bowels, so they may be, uh, maybe have diarrhea, or they could have uh, decreased uh, peristalsis, uh, which would be a hypoactive bowel, and uh, that, of course, would lead to constipation. They may have an ostomy in place, um, which is an art artificial opening uh, that rids the body of waste. Um, it may be the result of congenital bowel abnormalities. Uh, it may be the result, result of uh, cancer, and they've had to have a bowel resection. Uh, it may be the result of uh, severe Crohn's disease, which is a, uh, in, uh, an inflammation of the uh, small intestine and then uh, maybe the result of ulcerative colitis uh, where uh, uh, as the word implies uh, the colon is inflamed and, and full of ulcers uh, and it may you know severe cases of UC uh, the patient uh, may end up with a again a bowel resection and a, a colostomy could be the result of abdominal trauma as well uh, and uh, you'll see that hole or that stoma uh, with perhaps a bag detached. So the round circle with the dot uh, indicates um, uh, a sigmoid 
uh, colostomy, uh, descending colostomy, uh, double barrel colostomy, um, an ascending colostomy. So depending upon where the stoma is, uh, will give you an idea of um, uh, you know where it's located, whether it's located in the colon or whether it's located in the small intestine, like an ileostomy. And there's an example of a uh, ostomy bag. Uh, and you notice on the bottom there, uh, it uh, it has the ability that once it's full, uh, that it can uh, be opened up and drained. Um, these bags do um, come dislodged. Uh, they have to be replaced. Uh, and patients with ostomies usually have an ostomy nurse that's assigned to them uh, that cares for that stoma, that helps them understand how to care for it themselves. Uh, and patients get pretty good uh, at um, at uh, replacing those if they need to, draining them when they, when they need to. And uh, this is rather an older picture of an ostomy bag. Um, just like anything else, they have uh, designer ostomy bags. Uh, they have uh, ostomy bags that uh, fit under swimsuits and um, are very hard to detect. Um, but uh, this is an example of an older one. Um, G-tubes are uh, gastrostomy tubes. They're tubes that can either go in the mouth, which would be an OG for oral gastric, or they can go in through the nose, which would be an NG, which would be nasogastric. And here they're measuring um, the length of the tube uh, and then inserting it. Uh, it looks like an OG here. And you can use these gastrostomy gastrostomy or gastric tubes um, to um, uh, uh, decompress a stomach that's full of air, uh, decompress a stomach that's full of liquid in, in a bowel obstruction. Um, you can use them to um, administer nutrients into the stomach as well. Uh, here's a, uh, um, a, a G-tube in the abdomen of a baby on the top and an adult on the bottom. Uh, and G-tubes um, uh, are tubes that go directly into the stomach and uh, you would just uh, access a, a catheter would screw onto that and that's how they receive their feeding is through the G-tube. Um, yeah, and again where the location of the tube is uh, gives you an idea of uh, a gastrostomy tube uh, jejunostomy ju tube, um, and yeah, they're showing different locations uh, for that in this particular picture. Uh, and they're showing the feeding bag that goes into a pump and then is pumped into the stomach if they've got uh, the top two look like a, a, an NG tube and an OG tube, uh, and then down below are actual G tubes. Uh, which go right into the stomach or right into the je jejunum. And um, uh, the issue with these is they can become plugged, uh, they can become dislodged, uh, and it, 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 if the uh, G-tube becomes dislodged in the stomach, um, there really isn't a whole lot of bleeding that goes on with that. And uh, typically we bring them to the hospital and the ED physician just reinserts it and we take them back. Um, when dealing with uh, gastrostomy tubes, uh, you know, doing your abdominal assessment, they may have some abdominal pain. Um, they may have signs of distension, rigidity. Uh, you want to listen to bowel sounds in all four quadrants. Uh, you want to determine whether they have tenderness or pulsating masses and then uh, what their normal bowel habits are and if, if these are uh, more than abnormal. Uh, with ostomies, you may see some abdominal distension, or certainly that's what you want to look for to know that you've got some problems with the ostomy is a distended abdomen, bleeding from the stoma itself. Um, they may need help changing the pouch. Uh, and if, if uh, not, if that's not something that, that you can do or they have uh, pouches to, uh, to replace one that's become torn or non-functional, then you may have to transport them to the closest facility to uh, have that um, taken care of. 
Yeah, it's of interest to note that um, the stoma is usually going to look much like mucous membranes. Um, the stoma itself, the hole, should be pink. Uh, and when the stoma is really pale, um, that would indicate a compromised blood supply. Uh, these again, stomas can become irritated, they can become infected, uh, in which case uh, it may lead to something like sepsis. Um, management in those situations are supportive. Uh, make sure that you, uh, there's no issues with the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. Uh, give them some oxygen if necessary. Um, obtain some vital signs, uh, maybe an ECG. Um, some complications associated with feeding tubes, again, wound infection, fluid aspiration. Um, if you overfeed or if the patient is overfed uh, with their G-tube um, and their stomach is completely full, um, they can vomit just like uh, you know anybody else whose stomach is completely full. Um, or if it doesn't agree with the patient or whatever, they can vomit and aspirate that uh, and develop an aspirate pneumonia. So you may be called to a person who has all the classic signs and symptoms of pneumonia, but the key here is it came on suddenly following an aspiration, um, uh, following a G-tube feeding. They may be dehydrated, may have electrolyte imbalance. The two may become destruct, obstructed or dislodged. Uh, they may develop a, an inflammation around the stoma and develop a peritonitis. The two may leak, so you get uh, whatever it is you're putting in there uh, leaking into the abdominal cavity, which again will cause a peritonitis. Um, it could have bowel obstruction, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, OGNG tube complications. Uh, you know, it used to be in the scope of practice that we could put an NG tube in, uh, but that has since been removed. Um, but however, if a patient has one, they can be misplaced. Um, you know, I've seen them, uh, uh, you know, in the lungs um, when it's supposed to be in the stomach. Uh, they can become plugged. They can, um, uh, the equipment uh, that pumps the stuff in may become uh, not non-functional. Um, you want to check the tube for proper position, uh, and you can do that by um, squirting air into the tube while listening to the stomach, and you should hear a boop as air bubbles through the liquid in the stomach when you uh, inject that air through the uh, NG or OG tube. Uh, you could use saline to irrigate the tube, and um, you can hook the tube up to your suction uh, equipment and provide uh, a low, vo low volume intermittent suction. Um, irritation of a G-tube is not emergent. Uh, if it looks infected, the physician needs to evaluate it. Uh, if it is bleeding, you treat that like you do any other bleeding with direct pressure over the over the hole. Um, uh, dislodged, the uh, fistula of the G-tube uh, will close itself within um, uh, four to six hours. Um, again, as I said, there's usually minimal bleeding when the G2 becomes dislodged, but the importance here is that the stomach contents now can leak into the abdomen, causing a peritonitis. Um, cover the hole with a sterile dressing. It doesn't have to be airtight or occlusive. Uh, some genitourinary problems that you might deal with, uh, urinary stasis, uh, urinary tract infection, urinary uh, retention. Uh, patients may have catheters. Um, there are external catheters. Uh, often called a Texas catheter, where uh, you have what looks like a condom uh, that fits over the penis or a um, uh, uh, fits over the opening of the vagina, and uh, it's outside the uh, genital urinary tract, uh, so they uh, urinate into those devices uh, that are connected to a bag that may be strapped to the leg and um, uh, they're able to uh, uh, handle their uh, urine that way. They could be indwelling, like a Foley catheter, um, and of course Foley catheters um, are, are just chronically prone to um, urinary tract infections and sepsis uh, are, are big problems associated with uh, 
Foley caths. Uh, some types of urinary catheters could be suprapubic or, or a urostomy. Um, uh, a catheter that's put um, above the pubis uh, into the bladder so that the bladder can drain uh, or a catheter that's put directly into the urethra uh, so it can blain, drain the bladder that way. Uh, Foley cath again is, is not something that we do uh, it's not within our scope but uh, you may work for services uh, particularly hospital based services where you do uh, assist or even put in Foley catheters. Um, Foley catheters are put in to replace existing indwelling catheters that don't work, uh, to replace uh, indwelling catheters that have accidentally been pulled out, um, and if a person has uh, issues with incontinence or retention, um, Foley catheters, you can do what's called a quick cath. Um, you know, we'll have elder males uh, who develop urinary uh, retention issues. Uh, they'll come in, they haven't peed in days, their bladder's about ready to burst, and it causes a, a significant vagal response. And these patients can get bradycardic, um, you know, and not really understand that it's all related to not being able to pee. But most of them that I've dealt with have been miserable, and uh, you do a quick cath, you put a, either put a Foley in, or just a straight catheter in the urethra, into the bladder, um, you know, drain out about a thousand mils, uh, and wait a while, and then drain some more. If you drain too much out, um, the bladder itself can go into spasm, uh, which can be painful as well. Uh, catheters do fall out, um, and a good indicator of that is the, the they're not draining any urine um, or you may have urine leaking uh, out around um, the catheter uh, the patient may develop uh, sepsis as a result the site can become red and sore uh, on removal particularly if you don't deflate the balloon uh, there can be a little bleeding around the meatus uh, management for genital urinary problems is supportive uh, transport persistent discomfort, uh, securely attach a leg before you transport below the bladder level, um, you know, this, they're gravity fed, so you want to keep the Foley bag below the patient, not above. Um, with a suprapubic catheter, it needs to be replaced within 20 minutes or the surgical opening will close itself up. Uh, acute infections, uh, sudden infection, again those patients who are at home and may be elderly and have a decreased uh, perception to pain, um, uh, they are at greater risk of uh, increased infection rates, particularly if they've got indwelling catheters. Uh, their rate of uh, sepsis is, is higher uh, and as a result their mortality rates are higher. Uh, airway infections can be common in the immunocompromised patients, like the development of pneumonia. Uh, they have poor peripheral perfusion, and uh, because they're sedentary uh, and immobile, they're at, at greater risk for uh, things like pulmonary embolus as well. Um, in any sort of indwelling catheter, there's always going to be the risk of sepsis. And remember our our um, SARS, or excuse me, our uh, SIRS, um, they have to have three of four things present to have SIRS, and SIRS is a precursor to sepsis. So remember tachycardia, tachypnea, and temperature, fever greater than 101.4. The other thing would be a white count, and we're not going to get that in the field, but we may be able to see that if we're hospital-based and take the patient to the hospital. Um, they may have uh, wounds from surgeries uh, and it's important to look at those incisions to make sure that they're not open, to make sure they're not, um, you know, weeping pus uh, or infected. Um, and things like nutrition uh, really um, affects 
you know, how well a patient's wound is going to heal. And if the elder homebound patient has extremely poor uh, nutrition, the wound may take longer to heal. There's an increased risk of infection, especially if they're not able to care for the wound daily uh, by themselves and they don't have home care. Abscesses and cellulitis are certainly acute infections that you see in, in patients who are homebound. Uh, signs and symptoms of, a, of an acute infection include fever, tachycardia, tachypnea. Uh, they may be generally weak and um, not much of an appetite and may feel nauseated and have some vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, you know, you're looking for um, acute infections of a wound. The wound should not be, uh, you know, oozing, uh, purulent green, uh, sort of um, pussy. Um, substances. Uh, it can certainly be red and bruised around an open wound. That's a normal part of, of healing, um, but uh, it should not be uh, black and, and should not be necrotic and, and uh, oozing stuff. Um, wound irrigation is not something that we do. Uh, wound packing is not something that, that we do. Uh, for uh, you know a chronic, um, let's say in this case, looks like uh, perhaps a polyneural cyst uh, that's been um, uh, lanced and uh, has uh, uh, been unpacked, and now they're irrigating it, and then they pack it full of uh, packing gauze and then uh, seal it up. And that's something that has to occur often daily. Uh, decubitus wounds or pressure sores, uh, decubitus ulcers, bed sores, whatever you want to call them, they're the result of prolonged pressure on a body part. Um, when you put pressure on a body part, then they get an inadequate blood supply to that area. And uh, because of no good blood supply, the tissue starts to break down and decays. There are four stages of decubitus, of course, one being the least and four being the worst um, stage of, of these ulcers. And um, uh, again, it's just a result of improper uh, turning uh, in a bedridden patient, uh, not turning them at least every two hours uh, or, or more frequently to keep those bed sores from uh, occurring. Uh, we'll see decubitus, or we can cause decubiti uh, uh, just by putting a patient on a long spine board. And those uh, parts of the body where uh, uh, are pushing hard against that hard wooden board, uh, they get little blood supply, and within an hour, the skin starts to break down and decubiti start to uh, develop. Drains, uh, patients may have all kinds of drains that you might see or have to deal with. Uh, drains are placed into incisions and surgical wounds to help them drain. There are a Penrose drain, which is what we used to use for tourniquets. Uh, it's just a rubber tube. Uh, there's a Jackson Pratt. Uh, drain, uh, and then a hemovac drain. And a hemovac drain is a drain uh, that's pictured here, uh, where uh, you've got a uh, um, like a bulb syringe device on the end of the drain, and uh, you disconnect that, and you squeeze all the air out of the device, and then you connect it back to the drain, and that negative pressure as that device starts to expand and pull stuff out of the wound. Um, and those have to be uh, dumped and, and um, uh, cared for daily. Okay, there's a hemovac draining system right there. Um, drains can become infected, uh, red, warm, swollen, painful. Um, uh, note the size, the location, and the appearance. Look for drainage and leaking. Uh, the dressing should be dry and intact. Uh, if the if the wound is weeping a lot and the dressing is is uh, you know again full of pus and those sort of things, then you know there's an infection. And the the problem with that, of course, is the uh, development of sepsis. Management is uh, ABCs. Uh, if the um, dressing is um, dirty and contaminated and wet and uh, then we need to replace a, a clean, dry, sterile dressing over the wound. And as I had mentioned before, uh, sepsis is the common problem that you're going to deal with, and you'll know that precursor, uh, that SIRS, uh, by tachypnea, tachycardia, and temperature. Maternal and child care. Uh, some possible home problems that you might see with maternal and child care 
include uh, postpartum hemorrhage, postpartum depression, uh, postpartum infections, uh, pulmonary emboli, particularly if they're um, you know not up and moving around, uh, infantile apnea. Uh, these are infants that are, are known to suffer from apnea and are set home on apnea monitors. Uh, sept septicemia or a blood infection in the newborn uh, or sepsis in the newborn may be something that you may see as well. Uh, hospice and comfort care. Um, uh, hospice again allows the patient the dignity to die in their own home if that's what they'd like to do. Um, so it gives the patients uh, a choice regarding uh, what sort of life support they want. Um, these are in patients who know they have a terminal illness. Um, uh, it's the patient's choice as to whether or not to inform family members of their terminal diagnosis. Uh, and again, uh, the whole purpose of, of hospice is uh, the patient then chooses to die at home. Um, some may not choose to die at home, and that's why many hospitals will have a hospice room. Uh, so when it comes time to die, uh, the patient is admitted to, the, to hospice uh, and is provided comfort care uh, until they die. Um, some end-of-life uh, symptoms include uh, pain, fatigue, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, loss of appetite, muscle wasting, nausea, uh, depression, uh, confusion, and concentration loss. Many of these patients are on um, significant pain medications. Uh, so the, the, you know, the nausea, the uh, fatigue, the depression, the confusion uh, may all go along with uh, the amount of medication that they're taking for their symptoms. Um, in a hospice patient, uh, because a patient chooses to die does not mean we don't provide comfort care. Uh, if the patient is in pain, we need to alleviate that pain. Um, back in the day in, in terminal patients, uh, when the end was near, it was a common practice just to give them a lot of pain meds. Uh, you know, just lethal doses of uh, a pain medication so that they would slip away comfortably. Um, that's not that's not allowed anymore uh, for obvious reasons it doesn't mean that we don't manage the patient's pain uh, but um, you're not going to see a you know a physician load somebody up on uh, pain meds to uh, uh, to uh, speed up their passing um, palliative care uh, we need to care for their condition and comfort care we need to make them comfortable so hospice doesn't mean that we you know, we don't provide care. Uh, it just means that uh, we keep them as comfortable as we can until they pass. Um, when a patient is admitted to hospice, there are certain things that often go along with that admission. Uh, one is that um, uh, they've indicated they have a terminal illness. They've indicated that should they die because they are terminal uh, that they do not want to be resuscitated. So part of hospice care is, is uh, getting those advanced directives in place, getting those DNR orders signed and um, your hospice nurse who's with the family and the patient through all of this uh, is a great resource for those that information. Um, I think it's important that, that perhaps we look at the culture of how different um, ethnicities deal with death um, because you know there are many uh, religious beliefs uh, you know as an example in the Jewish faith uh, in a true um, Jewish passing um, uh, there needs to be a um, an, maybe not necessarily an elder but uh, somebody uh, from the Jewish faith with them when they pass. Um, their body is to be washed and wrapped in a, uh, a shroud and uh, you know those sort of things. So understand that there, there are various um, different processes that different cultures go through uh, when, uh, when death occurs and um, also understand that religion affects decisions on uh, whether or not uh, a patient is to have an autopsy, whether or not a patient is uh, to be an organ donor, 
Uh, and then there are many after-death rituals. I remember um, it wasn't that long ago, maybe about 25, 30 years ago, um, we had a small population of uh, gypsies uh, in our area. And when a gypsy passed, uh, it was very common for them to have the embalmed body uh, sitting in a chair or a throne um, on the porch. And they would party around that uh, deceased uh, for days. And, uh, of course, now that's not uh, allowable, um, uh, at least um, <clears throat> not that I'm aware of. Uh, but uh, it was very common to do that, was just to sit the body upright uh, and uh, celebrate their life for uh, several days. All right, so uh, that ends uh, Chapter 42, and if you have any questions, you do know how to get a hold of me. Um, I'll be talking to you soon.